Ассаламу алейкум, спасибо. Это наш профессор, локальный координатор Дельмурат Хедавранбеков. Ну да, здравствуйте. Здравствуйте, здравствуйте. Я извиняюсь, что сейчас зайду в кабинет, будет более-менее стабильная связь. Сейчас я немножко не в стабильной зоне. Так, если разрешите, мы можем начать, Дарья. Да, так, хорошо. Я вкратце объясню, как бы, введение, если можно. Угу. Меня зовут Хабибулла Насыров, я являюсь координатором SpaceCom проекта. И, так сказать... Uh, у нас имеется, как я уже сказал, 6 вузов и 2 non uh, Плюс у нас уже это четвертый день. Ну, если можно, я перейду на английский. Today is the first day of our winter online school within the framework of SpaceCom project. And today we have uh, lectures of Daria Stepanova from the ExoLunch Uh, company. Her topic is CubeSat Technologies. And if you're ready, Daria, the floor is yours, please. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. So the language will be English, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, great. Um, very nice to meet you all. And that's a pleasure for me to, uh, to be here today and share my experience and share my knowledge with you all. Um, I'm going to start the screen sharing. Please tell me. Oh, just a second. Just a second. Yeah. So do you see my screen, right? Yes, we can. Yeah, great. Uh, all right, yes, so uh, regarding our uh, sessions, we're going to have two sessions. Uh, today is the first one, and today we're going to talk about nanosatellite technology uh, and their applications. Um, uh, and I will start with some background and introduction of our company, of uh, ExoLaunch of German Orbital Systems, um, a little bit about myself. Then we'll go to the topic of CubeSats, and uh, we'll discuss why they became so popular within last years. After that, uh, we'll go through the application, possible applications of the small satellites, and we'll see how uh, dramatically the satellite market is evolving and how many more new cool applications there are for small satellites. Uh, after that, we will discuss the design specifications of what uh, we need to take into account while we're building the small satellite. Um, that would be the next topic, building a CubeSat compliant to this specification. And we'll finish the, today's lecture with the topic, how to launch the CubeSat. So we'll discuss possible launch vehicles in the end. I would propose to have the structure of like maybe having 50 minutes uh, lecture and then 10 minutes breaks. So this three times in a row, I think that would be comfortable for everybody. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to interrupt me uh, and we can start a discussion while the presentation. Uh, all right, um, so what's the scope of today? So that's the short introductory lecture about the CUBE submissions in general. So we're not going too deep in detail, but we're going to cover like the basics. Um, and the basic knowledge, what do we need to take into account when we want to build it and uh, how to start uh, basically with the CubeSat projects. The goal is to give like the first insights to, and to provide some basic terms and definitions. Um, and we'll go through many examples of these missions. And at the end of the lecture, um, you will know what the CubeSat is um, and how to work with that. Actually, I have a question. Uh, Uh, have you heard about the term CubeSat? Uh, do you know what, how to build them and so on? Yeah, we know you what know, uh, so CubeSats, but, but we didn't, uh, how to say, uh, start to build them. And so it would be first time because this direction is first for us. Okay. Yeah, but that's great that you have, uh, yeah, have heard the term. Uh, a few words about myself. I am... Um, Um, I'm working at German Orbital Systems at Exo Launch, a senior, a senior uh, system engineer. 
I have eight years of experience in electrical design, six years of project management, five years in aerospace projects. In total, I was a part of uh, 10 cool projects with a um, total amount of 10 satellites in orbit. I have background uh, in electrical engineering, uh, mathematical modeling, and aerospace engineering. Um, yes, and I am basically uh, at Exo Launch at GOS. I'm responsible for mission design, electronics, and project management. Um, a few words about our team. So a German Orbital Systems was founded in 2014 and ExoLaunch was founded uh, several years earlier uh, by graduates of Technical University of Berlin. And since then, we are proposing um, different solutions for our space market. So our portfolio includes um, satellites, separation systems, and uh, launch service. Um, a few words about uh, what we're doing in more, in more detail. So uh, we provide CubeSat uh, components, CubeSat systems that include um, pretty much everything what satellite needs for the proper functioning. These are onboard computational modules, um, batteries, electrical power systems, structures. Um, so together, yeah, um, transceivers, uh, sun sensors, solar arrays, and cameras. Um, besides that, we conduct workshops and provide some educational uh, resources. Uh, here you can see that's the uh, flat satellite of, from one of our projects. Um, yeah, uh, here's me. And as an example, in 2019, we launched um, six three-unit CubeSats um, for different uh, missions, starting from IAE's weather monitoring and on-orbit demonstration. Earlier this year, uh, actually, the, in the end of the last year, we launched a 6U CubeSat, so it's a big one, also for weather monitoring and for on orbit demonstration. Um, yeah, as you, you've seen on the previous slides, we are building three unit CubeSats, six unit CubeSats, bigger satellites, up to 100 satellites. So basically, um, our customers. Uh, approaching us with the payloads ideas. And for these payloads, we are already developing the, or adjusting our satellite bus. And we are providing the full service, starting with just consultation, finishing with launch and operations. A few words about the services. So that they include the frequency consultation um, that is basically the communication with ITU in coordination process to fix the frequencies for the upcoming launches, launch services. Uh, so with ExoLaunch together, we're uh, offering the launch services for small satellites, technology transfer. Uh, this is turnkey solutions, um, which can actually be extended to full technology transfer program. Basically, uh, we're not just giving the lectures, but also uh, providing the in detail how to build the satellite um, starting like from scratch. Research and studies. Um, so we conduct scientific studies for our customers and with our customers. For example, right now we're finishing uh, the study with ESA on in-orbit demonstration missions and we're trying to optimize um, the approach for, and the methodology for in-orbit demonstration missions. We have some university programs uh, which give um, different institutions uh, a chance to work with real satellites in our team. So that includes internships uh, like starting from one month uh, ending to one year. And uh, of course, engineering services, we can also like solve customer specific problems, including hardware, software, ground stations, and also launch. Um, yeah, regarding the launch service uh, with the EXO launch, we're together providing the separation systems and separation sequences controllers. Um, regarding ground stations, we have uh, several stations in the Eastern Hemisphere. Uh, we, in total, we can provide the access for S-Band, UHF, um, and some of our partners also. Uh, provide expand communication. Uh, mission control center for our missions is situated in Berlin. Um, from there, we like have full access to our, our satellites and we also offer cost-effective 
uh, mission control center for our customers uh, as a service. Uh, here you can see some cool pictures of our hardware uh, in the test facilities. So we also provide environmental test companies, which include uh, thermal vacuum tests or shaker tests. Um, yeah, so our launch service includes uh, launch of CubeSats of different form factors, starting from three, actually starting from one U up to 16 U. Um, at exit launch, we're providing um, launch, this launch deployers, which you can see on this picture, um, which can uh, afterwards be installed on the launch vehicle. Oh, here are some, some cool pictures from our previous missions and previous uh, launch campaigns. Um, I, I would like to mention here that yeah, we're one of the companies, a few in the world who are providing turnkey solution, which means that customer delivers the satellite in our office and then uh, all the paperwork, uh, which is uh, one of the biggest headaches actually uh, during this uh, all this process. So we're taking it all on that, on us and making it like really smooth for payload providers to giving them a chance to launch their payloads and launch their satellites in a like really smooth and flexible way. Um, a few words about what equipment and what are our capabilities. Um, in Berlin, we're having the class A clean room available since 2016, like almost for, uh, for more than four years. Um, so basically all the works with the satellites and uh, integration into flight deployers is happening in the clean room facilities. Uh, basically, we have all necessary equipment to work with satellites and with uh, launch uh, deployers. Uh, yeah, and for more information, please visit our website and have a look and like more closely at what we're doing. Um, right, so then after this quick introduction, I propose to jump in uh, CubeSats and applications. Do you have any questions so far? Oh, everything fine? Everything's fine. Okay. One hour is yes. One hour is everything's fine. Thank you. Cool. All right. Um, um, yeah. So, CubeSats, uh, what this term is about and when it was developed. Um, so, here on the left, you can see Bob Twiggs and Georgie. So, these are two main inventors of the CubeSat technology. Uh, in 1999, so more than 20 years ago, um, at Stanford University, um, this concept was born. The idea behind that was to bring uh, educational organizations closer to aerospace technology, to make universities be able to launch their space missions and launch their instrumentation in a more easy and a more flexible way. Uh, and what is more important in much cheaper and much smaller development time. So that uh, resulted as the first release of CubeSat design specification. Uh, today is actually the 14th release already. So what is the CubeSat? CubeSat is the U-class spacecraft. It's a type of this miniaturized satellite uh, for space research and for other space application that is made of multiple cube units. Each cube unit occupies 10 by 10 by 10 centimeters. This is the smallest one. And um, like, it's not a tight requirement that every unit has to be not more than 1.33 kilograms, but for every unit, uh, there is a like a maximum limit, which depends on the launch provider. And you, often these um, satellites, they use commercial of the shelf components for the electronics and structure to bring the development cost below. Kipsets are normally put into the orbit as a piggyback or launch during the piggyback um, and during the launch of like some bigger main payload or from the International Space Station. As uh, of 2020, so uh, until the last year, there were more than 1,300 1, CubeSats. CubeSats have been launched, and later we'll see the statistics about where these uh, CubeSats belong. 
Uh, on the picture on the left, you can see in different form factors. So CubeSats start, normally start from one unit, uh, two units is already like a little bit bigger satellite, uh, up to 12 units. And in 12 units, it's possible, pretty much possible to fit some like advanced um, hardware and advanced instrumentation for uh, research, uh, earth observation or information technology. There are some projects regarding 16 new uh, satellites um, and also fractions of one unit, which is like 0 0.5 units, 0 0.25 units, but these are quite non-standard. So most of the satellites are, they're looking yeah, like that, uh, like this set of um, sat satellites shown on the left. Um, yeah, I really like this uh, this picture and it really shows the simplicity and the way the CubeSats uh, methodology evolved. So basically there's a really small cube which you can stack uh, one onto another. And um, in this way, you're enhancing the capabilities of your satellites. There are kind of two, four types of missions for CubeSats. The technology demonstration is the one, um, I think, um, which most of the organizations around the world are interested in. Scientific research and educational projects, they more belong to university programs and commercial uh, missions. They include earth observation, um, tracking machine to machine communication and so on. Main advantages of um, building these types of satellites is uh, the rapid development. Basically, standard time of building this kind of satellite is uh, around two years. At the uh, Exo launch at the German Orbital Systems, we achieved eight months development time from like the very scratch, uh, very beginning of the project until the launch and operations. So that really brings the the speed down of the development of and then the launch. Um, this is a pretty simple technology. Uh, so it's possible to buy components from any electronics shop. There is a backside of um, this advantage is that these components, which are normally used for CubeSats, they're not uh, radiation hardened. Uh, in other words, um, that means that they might be subjected to some failures while on the low Earth orbit or uh, medium orbit. Um, but there are some tricks to mitigate that. And uh, there's also a list, I think, of components already existing, uh, which have been tested uh, in space and which can be used uh, like in other missions. Um, this keeps us a simple to design. Um, Sometimes it actually the trickiest question is how to fit everything you want into this such a small volume. But when you don't have much space, you cannot put a lot of a lot of stuff inside. So it's relatively simple, and that's why it, it became so popular in universities projects. Um, with the space debris, it's also a trick question because. Uh, taking into account the fact that most of the CubeSats are launched into low Earth orbit, which is uh, like around 500, I think is the favorite orbit for the small satellites. Um, they can burn up in the atmosphere upon re-entry. Um, yeah, so average decay time for the CubeSat is around like 20 years, uh, which is still good um, compared to some like graveyard orbits, like much higher where the satellites and the rocket parts are just floating there. Uh, and will be floating forever. So um, on one side, um, CubeSats are facing the question of space debris due to the fact that there are so many right now, but um, the decay time is still acceptable. And low cost, low cost is the um, outcome of the fact that there is a simple commercial of the shell components uh, I used. And on the other side, the fact that uh, the launch uh, provision has been simplified by the introduction of these deployers and specific dispensers for these types of satellites. Uh, makes it really, really cheap compared to uh, big and big and complex satellites. Regarding the orbit, um, yeah. So I think the most uh, 
attractive or before the sunlight starts with around 400 uh, it's almost the same as international space station um, and ends up somewhere at 600 um, as cubesats are not primary payloads for most of the launch vehicles um, cubesat providers do not normally choose the orbit they want to fly so uh, launch providers yeah, they give a set uh, of the possible orbits where the launch vehicle is going to go within uh, within the operations, and the providers can choose which orbit is most suitable for them. Uh, a few words more about the fathers of the CubeSat technology. So the Bob Twiggs was professor of Stanford. Uh, he actually founded the Space uh, System Development Laboratory at Stanford, so that was uh, it was a, the big professor. Um, and in late uh, 90s, 1999, he uh, came up with this CubeSat Stanford standard. And Georgi, uh, he was also professor, but at California Polytech University. Uh, later, he became the Tyvek Nanosatellite Sailing founder. Before he came up with um, the CubeSat design specification, he participated in different uh, satellite projects. And I think that was his inspiration towards the development of the standard. And in 2011, he, yes, he found the, the company called Tyvek. Yes, so what's the main purpose uh, behind the CubeSat design specification is to provide access for small satellites. Um, and as it was uh, mentioned, it was published in late 90s. And the first CubeSat based on this specification were presented on international conferences in 2001st and launched in 2003rd. Uh, the first satellite was separated uh, also in 2003. Uh, and it was, uh, yeah, pretty much the first mission. How that's, uh, here you can see the first orbital deployer which was called p-pod um, this kind of deployers were used for the cubesats back in the days so like 90s and early 2000s here on this picture you can see the cubesat it's basically it's integrated inside and this uh, instrumentation is later integrated into the frame of the launch vehicle at the at the moment in the orbit where the satellite shall be deployed. Um, the command from the launch vehicle is sent to this kind of deployer, and the satellite is ejected into our space. So the first deployers were quite small and not so advanced. And these are the deployers we are providing today. Um, so yeah, this is the deployer for 12 units in total, and it can be configured for 12 one u cubesats or for one big 12 unit cubesat or for the combination of six units and three unit satellites and on the left uh, these are the deployers but for the tests uh, basically uh, prior to the launch it's possible to integrate the satellite into this deployer and conduct tests on the shaker table um, yeah the simple representation how it was before and how it it is now if before it was required to build a big satellite um, and there was was no option to piggyback almost no option to piggyback the satellite with another launch so today um, this uh, like frame adapters which are installed instead of this satellite uh, on the on the last stage of the launch vehicle are used and it's possible to surround the frame with a bunch of these uh, deployers in total, making like 70 satellites launch for, for one mission. Um, a, a few words about specifics of CubeSat uh, missions some years ago. Um, the, these types of mission were mostly conducted by university with a strong emphasis, emphasis on education. Um, as you might uh, notice, as the price and as the de development time of the satellite uh, was reduced dramatically, uh, it's like really attractive to give hands-on experience for students in the universities to build this kind of uh, this satellite. However, it has been changed today. The majority of CubeSat, they have commercial background and most of them are dedicated for IoT 
to constellations, to motions, to intercommunications, uh, and the big part is still left for technology demonstration. And here we're starting um, to talk about the applications of CubeSat. I uh, have the information um, I just presented. Um, I, I just want to make it a little bit more in interactive. Do you have any ideas of which applications might be used for this kind of technology? Please, like, uh, don't hesitate to raise your uh, voice. Okay, so for this, we can do everything. Only satellite communications will help us. <laughs> and I don't know, it will be very great. Okay, any other ideas? Somebody wants to join it? Discussion? Okay, any <laughs> others? Если даже на русском можете присоединиться, if you agree. Дарья. Не стесняйтесь, если есть какие-то идеи, давайте. Так, right. ну, у нас... okay. yeah. Не, у нас просто многие позже подключились, поэтому, наверное, чуть позже они присоединятся. Ну хорошо. All right, yeah, then I... Uh... I'll, I'll continue. So yes, there are a lot of different applications for CubeSats uh, nowadays. Um, and all these uh, beautiful pictures, they uh, visualize what CubeSats can be used for. Uh, the first and the biggest one, I think it's a Earth observation. So the biggest constellation of the small satellites up to date, of CubeSats up to date, uh, it belongs to a company called Planet. Um, so the Planet's idea is to make pictures of the Earth with a revisit time uh, 24 hours, basically, um, they're picturing the Earth, all Earth, um, every day. Um, so with this uh, amount of data, like within time, it's, it makes it possible to see the changes, um, like in like really different aspects, starting with like vegetation, um, agricultural changes in the in the soil. Uh, how ocean is moving, how like water uh, is changing and so on. Uh, another one is synthetic aperture radars. So this is the satellite uh, dedicated for SAR imaging. Um, if we're talking about Earth observation, we are mostly thinking about visual spectrum or infrared. Uh, when uh, we're talking about SAR, these are radio frequencies and it's it makes it possible to picture Earth in different radio spectrums and to also gather information in different radio spectrums. And that's also can bring like an enormous benefits when we're talking about such fields as agriculture, marine time, and so on. The next big application is um, cargo and tracking of goods and basically like machine to machine communication while um, uh, like big, Ships are moving in the ocean. There's no communication for them uh, using the network, like the standard network we all used to. So the satellite communication using the constellation of small satellites can make it possible and make it much more cheaper than using existing um, solutions for communication. Uh, here it shall be mentioned that not only ships, let's say tracking, but also it's possible to track separate like cargoes, uh, which is also like really attractive for like some bigger companies. Um, in other words, um, when you are sending the package from one place to another uh, via ships, um, you can track exactly like your container and not just like the whole ship. Um, navigation and positioning is one of the like topics to discuss uh, regarding the small satellites. Um, then interplanetary missions, uh, here it was um, like uh, last year, um, there was the CubeSat um, launch, the, the CubeSat launch was launched, the, the one which went to the Mars and there uh, it was the NASA mission, there NASA demonstrated that 
small satellites can like be really used and be really useful while interplanetary missions. Um, so for example, as for that mission, the, it's called Marco mission. Uh, the small satellites were used as a red, red translator for the main spacecraft. Um, yeah, uh, Arctic monitoring and uh, sea monitoring, uh, fishing monitoring, it's like a lot, <laughs> all the possible ways of monitoring the Earth uh, makes it much more attractive with the use of constellation of small satellites. Uh, fire, like again, as fires monitoring and fast response to some natural disasters. Uh, we've already seen, for example, with the use of these planets, uh, CubeSats, that um, really fast and really like quick response to natural disasters can like, already save a lot of resources on Earth uh, regarding like the elimination of these uh, disasters. And machine to machine communication, basically everything is currently trying to be connected to internet uh, and diversifying the communication capabilities of our like vehicles of our devices uh, using the uh, low Earth orbit constellation network is also looks like a big, uh, big step forward. Uh, all right, yes, uh, that's the one example of uh, cargo tracking and uh, receiver of information signals. So here on the left, you can see the cargo, the big cargo ship, and on the right, you can see the tracking of the movement of this ship and of this cargo. So it's pretty much possible to get in, in information about the, uh, how the ship was moving in the, in the ocean or in the here you can see like it's a uh, middle east trajectories uh, and to track uh, the ships it's possible also to track uh, airplanes um, basically uh, that's a super cool use case uh, because when the airplane is traveling like Atl uh, through atlantic or like any other ocean um, and there are no ground station to track the position of the plane. And basically when planes crash and nobody knows where is it in the ocean, that's due to the fact that while airplane is traveling from one side to another, nobody really knows where it is. So ADSB um, tracking of airplanes is also a huge, huge potential field for CubeSats applications. Uh, and hyper hyperspectral imager together with uh, star and together with like standard uh, optical imaging can serve in the first of all agricultural in the forestry monitoring in the water monitoring then uh, here on the left you can see uh, different layers of hyperspectral imaging and on the right in the way that they are absorbed it's possible thus it's possible to see mixed vegetation and soil, uh, water layers, uh, soil and rocks layers. So basically we're filming the earth uh, in different uh, layers like onions. And there uh, with the hyperspectral imagery it's possible to withdraw information about every of this layer and to make a conclusion what happens in this layer. Uh, all right, and here we come to some statistics and what's, uh, what's been in the past and what's the predictions on, in the future. On this plot, you can see the statistics of the CubeSat missions starting from the very first one in 2000s um, and with prediction until 2025. Uh, in the green, you see the launched, already launched satellites uh, into orbit and red are launch failures. Blue are announced and uh, the gray one is the actual prediction for the next year's depending on like what uh, entities have announced the fact that they're going to launch their satellites. Um, basically, uh, the early 20s, um, while um, the first CubeSats were built and technology was evolving, but there was not so much, uh, there were not so many launches and like everybody was just getting used to the fact, uh, uh, getting used to this new technology. However, in 2012, uh, with the first uh, commercial, especially companies noticing the trend and 
space and the fact that it's becoming much cheaper and much faster to build and launch the satellites, um, the amount of CubeSats has been growing every year. Um, so yeah, 2012, there were already 25 satellites on orbit, while in 2017, there was the maximum whoop, of 297 satellites launched. Since um, then, the number has decreased slightly. That is due to the fact that the biggest constellation provider of the small satellites um, has already deployed the constellation on LEO. And um, the only thing they're willing to do in the next years is to support this uh, constellation, meaning they do not need to launch like 100 a year. They need like to launch around let's say 15 only so last per year. Um, and that was happening like to several constellation provider to like planets and to Spire, I think as well. Um, however, based on the announcements and predictions, the number of small satellites is gonna still be growing. Um, yeah. There are a couple of reasons behind it. The first one as uh, We've already heard the attractiveness in terms of costs and schedules. The second one is the fact that there are pretty many new launch vehicles um, developing right now. And uh, there might be more options for CubeSats to be launched and the price might even go even lower within upcoming years. Uh, here you can see the statistics based of, uh, of satellites launched based on organizational type. Um, in green, you see the launched ones. In blue, not launched by announced. And the trend is um, purely commercial um, with almost double the size of universities' uh, launches. So they, they were already 422 satellites launched by companies and half of them, actually more than half of them belongs to constellation providers. Uh, on the other side, universities have launched 286, which is also like pretty big number of satellites. Agencies are less interested uh, in the in this market because um, yeah, there there are a couple of reasons behind that, and one is, is I think is that agencies are much slower in terms of decision making towards like innovative solution than the like, companies and universities. Military-wise, um, the biggest portion is belonging to the U.S. military satellites. Um, and like as for others, you can see that uh, institute nonprofit schools uh, have like not so many satellites launched. Um, there are also one individual satellite. There was a, somebody who decided to make their own satellite and to launch it and independent belongs to like some independent organizations. Um, on this map, you can also see the distribution of uh, satellites uh, by country, uh, with the US beating, I think, everybody else uh, together, launch, like, uh, launching 1,000, more than 1,000 satellites, uh, like in total. Uh, regarding the status of launched nano satellites, uh, 800, more than 800, uh, are still operational and still generate the scientific data and scientific, like they provide scientific outcome. Um, 200 satellites are not operational anymore, or they were not since the beginning. Um, 338 satellites have re entered the low Earth orbit and like the, the atmosphere of the, <clears throat> of the Earth. Um, and 93, which is like quite a big number, were not um, launched and were not tested due to the launch failure or deployment failure. Um, here you can see on this plot the number of orbits, um, like the orbit distribution per launch. And uh, we briefly have discussed that like earlier, the most attractive orbit so far is 500 kilometers, 97 degrees polar orbit, sun synchronous. Um, that's, yeah, basically where we have most of the satellites. 
then uh, going left and going right, the smallest orbit uh, was 200, 250 with 51 degree elevation, um, inclination, sorry. Um, and I, I suppose the satellite re entered quite quickly. Uh, and the furthest orbit was the Mars flyby in, in the deep space. That's these um, two satellites in the Marco mission. There was um, there were some attempts to launch satellite in high orbits, for example, 750, 800 kilometers. There were like nine satellites for that and to GTO orbit. Um, there were also two attempts to, to launch the satellite. As we can see, the fastest satellite to decay uh, like the lower the orbit, the faster satellite decays and uh, taking ISS orbit and taking all the satellites launched to the ISS or, or from ISS in total 296 satellites have been decayed. Uh, constellation wise, uh, on this plot, you can see the companies which are aiming to launch the constellations or to deploy the constellations in the near future. Um, in green, you can already see uh, satellites which are launched. Um, they are not necessary all in orbit right now, but um, yes, uh, so these, these are already launched satellites and the blue are planned and planned and not announced this. Uh, so on the left, you can see the planet company, which is doing the Earth observation uh, with total amount of 427 satellites. The second biggest uh, deployed constellation belongs to Spire with the total amount of 117 satellites and 33 satellites planned to be launched. Um, and Helios Wire is the, is the next one with total amount of 45. However, as like you can see in the, uh, in the plot, uh, many companies have really ambitious plans to cover the uh, low Earth orbit and like in general orbits with constellations um, and with all this amount of satellites, like it's gonna be like really crowded. Uh, I foresee in the in the near future. Um, by types, so yeah, um, we saw at the beginning that there can be different types of small satellites, starting with uh, 0 0.20, 0 0.25 unit cubesats, uh, and up to 16 unit cubesats. There are also some other um, types of satellites included, for example, like really non-standard ATU satellites um, or like other nanosats like picasats or nanosats with a weight from one to 10 kg, but are not necessary following the cubesat design specification. Um, and by year, uh, we, we can um, acknowledge that uh, the industry was evolving based on the smallest CubeSat form factor, which is 1U and 1.5U. Uh, here you can see the orange uh, and the yellow, like this orange color is dominating. Uh, once in 2013, Planet started the deployment of its constellation and like other companies noticed that 3U, like companies and organizations noticed that 3U is more advantageous CubeSat form factor, the green one belonging to 3U CubeSat form factor started dominating the statistics. Um, within the time, so like I think since 2019, um, some more demanding applications of CubeSat such as synthetic aperture radars or some advanced imaging payloads um, with the development of this instrumentation, um, it became we, like companies started requiring higher, like bigger satellite form factors and there are six units and 12 units and 16 units. CubeSats already been launched, like more of them have been launched. Um, and as for 2021, based on the prediction, the biggest amount still will be belonging to uh, three unit CubeSats, while six unit CubeSats will be in the second place. Uh, and already 16 U and 12 unit CubeSats will reach almost 100, 100 satellites for to be launched. Uh, this is also a cool, cool plot. This uh, belongs to amount of companies which have been 
founded in nano satellite uh, industry since two thousand uh, since nineteen ninety, and we can like see how how fast the sector is like developing. Uh, while the trend actually started in two thousand eleven and two thousand twelve, when some of the companies like which were on frontier has shown that this approach has lots of benefit. Every year, uh, there are like more than 40 new companies, uh, which um, brings us to a little bit of concern that the overall nanosatellite market is expanding quite quickly and there might be some like consolidations and some reformings in the near future. So there are quite a lot of companies right now and uh, some experts are a little bit concerned regarding the market sizes. Uh, and here, here you can see the example of uh, how many companies are launching different types of CubeSats and providing platforms and mission services. Uh, yeah, I think the, here my first part of the lecture is finishing. We can make a like um, 10 minutes break and then um, I will start with a cool table. Like I will show the table with some really interesting uh, insights. Is that fine? Oh, sorry. <laughs> so is there any questions? Yep. So I have one, if you don't mind, uh, about launching and uh, how to say to making some CubeSat about price. Can you share with us your experience? How much will it cost? So, for example, CubeSat of the, not so small, but like a medium sized CubeSat with yeah. just simple uh, tasks just like a navigating or just uh, taking pictures with a small resolution, how much will it cost and uh, uh, launching it? All right. Um, uh, regarding this, uh, the price, it really depends on the payload. It really depends on the like, mission scenario and operations. So um, like how much uh, engineering efforts will it need to up update the payloads, the, the, the platform uh, for this specific instrumentation. Uh, I think um, the average price is around 100 for three unit CubeSats to develop it. Regarding the launch price, it also really depends. Like uh, here, I might not give you an answer because we're uh, talking with, with each customers, uh, customer independently. Um, this depends on the launch vehicle. So um, for example, American like Falcon and Soyuz, like Russian Soyuz, they have like really different settings while providing these piggyback solutions uh, so, or Indian one. Um, some care about the volume more, uh, some care about the space more. So that also depends on the form factor. So obviously three units uh, will be cheaper than the six units you said. Uh, so that, that, that's a tricky question. And uh, this should no, be- No, no, no. For, for example, not exact price, but uh, from something till something. Like, uh, because I know this is not, uh, if you say some, for example, 100,000, and I will pay you and I will ask you just the lunch. No, just like, a, how to say, um, the beginning price and uh, I know the maximum is not exist, <laughs> but the cheapest price, what could be? For example, yeah, sure. we, have, we have fully, uh, how to say, uh, equipped rocket. And with a very small piece of the full space, and we are manufacturing for that exact place, and just uh, putting our uh, CubeSat to that very little one and launching the minimum, how much it could be. Yeah, okay. Uh, so, regarding that, it also starts from around 100. 
to launch. So manufacturing 100k and the launching also could be Around, 100k. Yes. It, it can be also cheaper depending on the conditions, but like I would say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. maybe like uh, how to say, uh, like in tourism, like rush hours or something like that yeah. when everything is already booked and you can just join to that place. So yeah. it could be cheaper, yes? Yes. Great, thank you. So any other questions? Uh, good afternoon. Uh, let me say good morning to, to Europe, to Germany. Uh, thank you very much, Daria. This was very nice uh, explanation of CubeSat. Uh, we are very excited. My question is, do you uh, planning or have you already launched CubeSat for scintillation monitoring? Um, thank you for the question. Uh, for what exactly monitoring? I didn't hear. Scintillation. Yes. Maybe I'm not, I'm not getting the word correctly. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, when the signal coming to from uh, satellite to the Earth, they are uh, coming through the, let's say, the atmosphere, there are the signal, uh, mm -hmm. let's say, the uh, ionizing, then this process called scintillation. Uh, scintillation, okay, I, I didn't hear there. <laughs> yeah, uh, right, so we, uh, like, at our company, we didn't launch the satellite for that application, but there are some, like, Helios Wire, for example, they're doing that, and uh, there are some other companies, I think. Yeah, so that's also quite big field for, like, for atmospheric monitoring, yes. But there, there are satellites like that. Okay, it means that the CubeSat, uh, I mean, the... CubeSat, yeah, this CubeSat can carry this instrumentation. And the process in their application now. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for the question. Okay, so 10 minutes, is it enough? Yeah. Right? Okay. So we'll have 10 minutes break. The Doom will be stayed. Mm-hmm. Okay.